The first thing to remember is that you're migrating an application. So it's a good idea to understand what that application is supposed to do, what resources it uses, what clients it serves, what servers are uh, involved and so on. Then when you think about positioning it in the cloud, you have to realize that there are a lot fewer defenses that are available to you by default. Unlike your on-premise where you have all this infrastructure already in place and you don't have to think about it, when you're putting things in the cloud, it's all out there. Uh, very little separating your precious application from the would-be attackers. So you need to worry about all kinds of things that maybe you didn't realize you need to worry about, things like access control. Who are the individuals that are supposed to have access, administrative or otherwise? What about network access? Which connections are supposed to come into and out of this application? Do you have integrations that you have to worry about, business partners, where are the users going to be on the internet, inside your organization, what about connections from the cloud applications to whatever you have in your data centers. All of these things have to be worked out, identified and secured, like storage. When you have an on-premise environment, you don't worry about storage, you know, disks of computers being accessible to the internet, but when you're in, your, in the cloud, they are. So you have to worry about making sure that the storage for your application is also secured. It needs to be encrypted, it needs to be access to, it needs to be controlled. These are things that you have to worry about. And the way to contain this angst is to go look for a good CSPM solution, Cloud Security Posture Management solution. There are quite a few of them out there. What it does is something like that would go over your environment using some kind of a checklist typically a CIS benchmark or something similar, and you know, make sure that you're checking all the, all the boxes and ticking all the, the T's and you're not missing anything. So the shared responsibility model basically defines um, who's responsible to what between the infrastructure service provider, that would be your AWS or Microsoft or uh, Google, and your company. So the IaaS provider is responsible for the infrastructure. That means the actual hardware, the servers, the air conditioning, electricity, and also physical security. Guards at the doors, cameras, eliminating unnecessary physical access so that nobody that doesn't have authorization can access the physical machines. All that is on the server provider. Basically everything else is on you. There is one caveat that w is worth mentioning and that's the question of business continuity. So backups and things of that nature. There are some aspects that the service provider is responsible for, sometimes at cost. You need to worry about additional availability zones and things of that nature, but they have some of the functionality available to you. But other things you need to worry about. So if you need to ensure that your data is consistent in a backup situation or a disaster recovery situation, that's on you to design your software to provide that. Everything else is really on you. So configuring the system, deploying the software, making sure that the data is there, that it's secured, that access is controlled, and allows connectivity from where it needs to go to where it needs to go. All of that is on you. And when the auditor comes around, your ISO 27001 auditor or your SOC 2 auditor or your PCI auditor, whoever may, the case may be, they're going to come to you to demonstrate that you're in compliance, that you are doing what you need to do. There's actually very little that you can offload in terms of responsibility from yourself onto the IAAS provider, just the sections that have to do with physical security basically point at AWS or, or, or Google and say they do that, I have no control. Everything else you need to be able to answer, you need to be able to demonstrate that you're in control and if, you know, God forbid something goes wrong, it's you're going to be your fault. So just remember that the infrastructure is just the infrastructure. They don't really secure your stuff, they secure their stuff. You need to worry about what happens with it. Let's start with the basics. So this is another step in the evolution of virtualization technology. So in the old days, we had virtualization of a whole computer. So basically you had multiple virtual computers or VMs that can run on a single hardware platform. And, you know, that's great. You could have on one piece of hardware, multiple computers, even running different operating systems. You can have a Linux and a Windows and whatever you want 
running in parallel using the same hardware, which is fine and it's been working like that for probably 20 years. And what people realized is that this is a little bit heavy duty because each of these VMs includes a complete operating system inside it. It takes time to power up, it takes a lot of memory, it takes a lot of resources, and maybe we can come up with a more lightweight solution. Of course, the answer is yes, we can. Uh, and those are containers. So a container is like a miniature lightweight virtual computer, except that it's not a complete computer, it's just the application stack without the operating system. The operating system is part of the infrastructure, and then you can have multiple containers sharing the same operating system infrastructure under it. And so each container is more compact, more lightweight and easier to manage. That's what containers are. And in a cloud environment, this is very attractive because it allows moving containers around, moving workloads from area to area, replicating them, having more or less of them, having an elastic compute environment, which is very advantageous when you have spike loads and all, thing, all kinds of things like that. So it's very popular and it's so popular that actually there's two ways you can go about that. One way is that the infrastructure service providers actually offer containerization as a service. So you can rely on AWS or Azure or Google to manage your containers for you and you're just in charge of creating the containers, putting them where they need to be and the provider's infrastructure allows you to replicate them and to move them and to uh, power them up and down and so forth. Or you can go your own way. You could deploy your own management platform. Typically people use uh, Kubernetes or K8, sometimes it's written. So you can deploy your own and use your Kubernetes environment to manage your containers on top of the cloud providers, even more fundamental infrastructure. So you can do both. If you go down the path of uh, build it yourself, you need the expertise staff that know how to configure these things. It's not totally trivial. Or if you go down the path of using the service, then you have to pay for it. Either way, it's really fantastic technology, very popular, and all the born in the cloud applications typically rely on it. So if you're building your own, you're migrating an application and you're restarting it and writing it from scratch or refactoring it in a major way, then it's a very good idea to consider containerization as part of the infrastructure and technologies that you might be interested in using. Let me answer with a story of uh, uh, something that I actually had uh, uh, involvement with. So the task at hand was to introduce a basically off-the-shelf solution into a cloud application. So there was some integration involved, some software to be built, and we needed to secure that thing. So the way it was done was during the design phase of this integration, we had a security review. Basically, the development team described what they wanted to do, what the system needed to do, what needed to connect to what, which components were involved, what resources were necessary. And it took about an hour to figure out what all the pieces were. And basically, at the end of that, we had a diagram, basically a one-pager description of the main pieces and what communicates with what and how, how the system is supposed to be architected. Then the development teams and the integrators went on their way and built their thing, it took them a while, and then they were ready and they were starting to plan their move to production. At that point, there was a second review in which we sort of brought back the diagram from the first review and said, okay, so what did you actually do? And then, of course, there finally you find that what was designed is not exactly what was built because uh, things happen along the way and they change technologies and they put things in different places. And so some of that became irrelevant and we had to adjust and correct and find out you know, what actually needs to be secured. And then we reviewed what they did in terms of security. And surprise, surprise, things could have been done better because development teams and integrators and DevOps teams and IT support staff, all of these people, their main job is to make sure that everything works. That's what they're measured on. They need to make sure that things operate and bring business value. So it's the easiest thing in the world to allow broad access and to allow everything to do whatever it needs to do without thinking about things like, you know, principle of least privilege, where you want to restrict the access and the permissions to the minimal set that you actually have to have and eliminate everything else. 
So you find these things in the second review and say, okay, but this is very open. Why do you need that? What do you actually need? Let's, let's narrow it down a little bit. So you do the second review and you come back with a list of action items to tighten things down. So there is a little bit more work for the deployment teams for the, you know, to, to do these things. Of course, you need to make sure that while you're doing that, you don't break anything because maybe they forgot something that they need. So you have to do a QA cycle and ensure that uh, after all these tightenings, the, the system still operates. Once you do that, then you move to production and then you need to monitor. Once you're in production, you also need to ensure that things don't change afterwards. You need to have a monitoring solution that checks that the environment that you've created is still secure going forward. So you need that as well after the fact. So if we can step back from this uh, a story and see, okay, what did, we, what did we learn here? So first of all, you need to involve security in the planning phase before anything gets written. You know, do a, a, a paper exercise of plan. What do you want to do? What do you think you want to do? And write it down, codify it. Then after, you know, it's in advanced stages, you do a second cycle and compare the plan to what was actually implemented and adjust and also drive action items to change the way the thing is secured because it's probably not secured like you want it to be. And then after they do that, you need to do another cycle of testing and ensuring that everything works. And then you need some kind of monitoring solutions deployed in production, at a minimum a CSPM type solution, and maybe other things to make sure that what you have going forward remains secure into the future. That's a question that many organizations are, are battling with and, and the dust hasn't settled yet. So as organizations start moving to the cloud, I think in order to utilize the agility and the speed that cloud offers, many times development teams, DevOps teams just rush ahead to deploy applications without tremendous amount of thought given to securing these uh, technologies. While the traditional security teams I kind of left behind with minimal visibility into what's going on and absolutely no control or any kind of ability to say no. Uh, this is in stark contrast to what used to be in the on-premise environment where if you wanted to deploy an application, you needed to file a ticket, get permission, have changes deployed in various systems and only after all of that activity has been finished then you actually have your system working so you know the old style took a long time sometimes weeks months until a new application could be deployed so nobody wants to revert to that but we are in a situation where the security teams are too far behind and that needs to be rectified. So I think the first stage, the minimal stage, and this is what some you know, forward-looking organizations are already doing, is at least to provide the security teams with visibility so that they can, in retrospect, see what happened. They can see what is being secured, is it reasonably secured, is anything changed in there, etc. So that's a basic level of visibility just to know what you have and to track if anybody made modifications to it. And that requires things like a CSPM solution and various monitoring solutions and so forth. And if you don't have that, you should absolutely right now go ahead and get one because that's absolutely mandatory. If you don't have that, you're blind. But that's not enough. I think that if we look a little bit into the future, I think organizations are going to realize that they need more. They need to be able to be proactive, that the security teams need to have ability to look at things before they go to production and say, well, you know, this is not a good idea, let's do it in a different way. But there's a battle of agendas here. You don't want to revert to the situation where the development teams need to ask for permission for everything that they do. That's just going to slow everything down and nobody wants that. So the industry needs to find a way so that you can have your cake and eat it too. So you, the security teams are able to define guardrails that are tested automatically during the development phase, during the deployment phase, in all kinds of checkpoints in the, site, in the software life cycle, these guardrails need to kick in and check whether whatever it is on the table is being done in a reasonable way, automatically checked, without human intervention, in a way that human intervention gets pulled in only when it's necessary. So if there is an exception, if something is outside the parameters of the guardrails, then a human needs to look into it and make a judgment call. But you want like 95% of these situations to be completely automatically resolved and without any kind of human involvement and there are technologies that are being deployed that are like that so you know infrastructure as code scanning 
and APIs that can be uh, deployed to check things before they get pushed into production, and, and, and there are other alternatives. So forward-looking organizations really need to be looking at that as the next phase after you deploy your basic CSPM solution and after you get some kind of visibility into what you have, you need to start thinking about, okay, how do I make sure that when developers push a new version out, I'm not going to be standing in front of something that I don't want to be in front of. You, know, you want to start getting this Wild West environment into control.